Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'd like to take a break from talking about why it's fun to run D&D and instead spend one short episode talking about why it's fun to play D&D. Why do we do this thing? Why have we chosen this as our hobby out of all the different kinds of games we could play? Video games and card games and board games and miniature war games, by the way, all of which I play. But having played lots of games and designed lots of games and even working for a game company, I think Dungeons and Dragons is the most fun you can have with your brain. I want to start by saying something that might be somewhat counterintuitive, and that is I don't think we play D&D because it's fun. I mean, obviously it's fun, otherwise we wouldn't do it, but it's not only because it's fun. Dungeons & Dragons is a very strange game. It's unlike board games and card games and miniature war games and video games. In those games, all you have to do is buy a copy of the rules, you read them, sit down with your friends and play. In Dungeons & Dragons, you've got four players, maybe five, who all they had to do was show up with a pencil and the rules, and maybe they had to buy some funny dice. But then there's this other player that we call the Dungeon Master, and he's not doing the same thing any of these players are doing. These players are each only playing one character, but this player is playing all the monsters and all the people there are to meet, and he invents all the quests and all the challenges, and he decides when these players try to do something, do they succeed? And that's a very strange thing to do. And if there's a downside to this, it's that the other player, the DM, he has to do a lot of work outside the game getting ready. He has to prepare the entire adventure, he has to build the entire world, and it's my job to tell you that that's actually quite easy and it's fun. But it is more work than just buying a copy of Bang or Settlers of Catan and reading the rules and playing with your friends. It's certainly a lot more work than buying a video game and picking up a controller. So since it's a lot more work for the Dungeon Master, there has to be some commensurate reward that makes it more than just fun. There are things that happen in D&D that don't happen in any other game that can't happen in any other game, and I pick D&D because it's my game of choice, but this is true of all role-playing games. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened just a couple of weeks ago in one of the games that I run at work. I'm telling you this story because I think it's an interesting illustration of what kind of stuff can happen in D&D that could never happen in another kind of game. So five years ago, I was running D&D for a bunch of friends of mine at work at Turtle Rock Studios, where I am the writer, and they called their team the Righteous Squad of Questing Adventurers because, in fact, everybody on that team was a member of Turtle Rock Studios Quality Assurance. And the party was as follows. Hi, I'm Lars. I played Andavari, L the Human Paladin. So, my name is Don, and I played the Dragonborn Grimlaka. I was a knight. I'm Brill, I play a fair and the half elven cleric. Alright, my name is Silvano, and I played as Balazar, the Dragonborn Warlock. I'm an Andrabi, I played Gink, the half orc ranger. And they spent four or five months going on adventures. This was fourth edition DD and leveling up. And at the end of that process, we started to crunch on the game we were working on, Evolve, which is a lot of fun. You should go play it. But after five or six months of playing, getting to about fourth or fifth level, we got to the point where we were really busy at work, and so we just stopped playing. That happens all the time. Five years passed, and we've grown the company a lot. There are a lot of new employees, and we shipped Evolve, and there's a new version of DD. So I went to a couple of the players in the original game and said, hey guys, let's get together with some of the new people in the company and play DD again. And the party was as follows. Uh, my name's Thomas, and I play Altair the Human Monk. I am now playing Sigurd Eld the Human Thief. Right now I'm playing as Razalax the Chill. He was a dragonborn uh, paladin. Correct. And you have, a, you have a squire, right? I do. Do you remember your squire's name? Yeah, it's uh, Kalith. Yes, awesome. Yeah. Look at that. Hi, I'm Anna, and I play Nasa, a human barbarian. And what about your, uh, your horse? Sassafras. <laughs> Hi, I'm Red, and I play Ellison Feathercast. Uh, and where is Ellison right now? He's in the abyss. Um, he got coaxed into it. Make your rolls, man. Make your saves. That's a life lesson I learned. Hi, my name's Jess, and I play Lady Sariel, the elven priest. Now turned vampire. And they called themselves the Revenant Vow, for reasons that are too complex to explain in this video. When Lars found out that the second campaign was happening in the same world and the same timeline, and only a couple of months after the events of the first campaign, he decided that Andavari and Sigurd were brothers, and that Sigurd was going to find out what happened to his missing brother Andavari, and, by association, the rest of the Righteous Squad of Questing Adventurers. We played every week for six months, and eventually their fifth level, and they're entering the Black Keep, the stronghold of Calarol the Vile. If I think of a campaign as a series of books, then the first five levels of this campaign were Book 1, and Calarol the Vile was the villain. So the Revenant Vow are delving into the Black Keep, seeking out Calarol the Vile, trying to find out what happened to the Righteous Squad of Questing Adventurers. Keep in mind that while these heroes are questing into this dungeon, going after the bad guy, they have no real idea whether or not the heroes from the old campaign are even still alive. Then comes a dramatic battle, a kind of mini-boss. The Revenant Vow are facing off against a couple of Slod. Now, Slod, or Slodai is the plural, are extra-dimensional toad beasts that were originally published in a book called The Fiend Folio back in the 80s. And I happen to have a lot of affection for a Slod. They're my next favorite monster after bugbears. I had originally decided that this encounter was going to be two blue slod and one green slod. Slod are color-coded to make them easy to collect. And the blue slods are big and tough, and the green slod is the crafty spellcaster and kind of the boss of these extra-dimensional toad beasts. 
The fight against the blue slods was tough enough, and there was a point where Lady Serial turned to Sigurd and said, Is this it? Is this how we die? I decided in that moment that throwing the green slot at them at the same time would be too much and probably overwhelm the party. Looking at the green slot's abilities, I had an idea. I had the green slot walk into the room and survey the battle. He saw that his two blue slot were being overwhelmed by a band of plucky adventurers. Now when the players see the green slot show up, they think, This is it, we are certainly dead. But then the green slot pulls out a scroll, reads it, and disappears. The party thinks about what this means, and they conclude that the green slot has teleported back to his home dimension to get reinforcements. This is exactly what I hoped they would think. After dispatching the two blue slots, they rest, they heal themselves, and they hear someone calling for help in the room beyond, the room the green slot came from originally. Entering the green slot's chamber, they find what appears to be a nest, kind of like that nest in Aliens. Looks like some sort of secreted resin. Yeah, but secreted from what? Including someone, a humanoid figure, still alive, calling for help, stuck to the wall using the slods secreted resin. Lars's character, Sigurd, approaches the figure stuck to the wall and says, Who are you? The figure is terrified. Are, are they dead? He asks. Lars says, Yes, the slot are dead. Who are you? The terrified humanoid figure stuck to the wall sees that the slot are dead and says, Gink. My name's Gink. At this point, even after what he considered to be an incredibly unfair battle, Lars turned to me with a huge smile on his face. He was incredibly happy to have found one of the characters from the original group still alive. It meant they were on the right track. It meant they might all be still alive. Sigurd immediately releases Gink, the half-orc ranger, from the wall. Gink seems sick, and the party remembers the Slod have the ability to implant tadpoles in their victims that later burst forth in fully grown Slod. At this point, that night, we had gotten to a good stopping point, and Lars said to me afterwards, Hey, having recovered Gink, does that mean Robbie can play with us? And I said, well, if he's around and he's willing to make a character, then yeah, why not? So I went and talked to Robbie. Robbie and I sat down, and I explained the situation to him. He said, hmm, let me think about it. A couple of hours later, he messaged me and said, yeah. I'm in. Next week when we sit down to play, Robbie has joined the party with his character Gink, the half-orc ranger. Gink says, listen, I've been here for weeks. I know all the passwords. I know exactly where the other heroes are. They're still alive. Calaril is using them for some ritual. I think he's going to try and summon Orcus. Orcus is bad news. What would have been a couple of hours and maybe a couple of sessions of the heroes exploring the dungeon turned into a chase. Gink had been a prisoner here. He knew exactly where to go. Finally, they stand before the door, on the other side of which is Calaril the Vile in the ritual room. The heroes prepare themselves. They cast many spells, preparing for battle. They talk about strategy, about what they're going to do once they get in. Finally, they kick down the door, and I describe what they see. Calaril the Vile in a huge chamber, a black portal before him. The bodies of all the members of the Righteous Squad of Questing Adventure are chained in front of the portal. Their life essence feeds the ritual. They see Balazar, they see Grimlaka, they see Andavari, they see Theron, and they see Gink. Several of the players at this point look at me and they say, Gink? Anna starts to explain to me, no, Matt, Gink is with us. The entire party looks at me, and then as one person, like you're watching a tennis match, all turn their heads to Gink. Then realization dawned, and Jess, playing Lady Serial, said, It's the slot! At which point I said, Gink attacks Sigurd. And then Robbie said, Hail Orcus! And I replaced Gink's miniature at the table with the green slods. Because what I had noticed when I looked at the green slods' abilities after having decided that this battle was probably too tough for a green slod was that green slods can polymorph. So I faked the green slod reading a scroll. There was no scroll. Green slods can also go invisible. Now the interesting thing about that is Lars said, wait a minute, we have dust of appearance. If we sprinkle dust of appearance, it will reveal any invisible characters. He suspected that the green slot had gone invisible. But the rest of the players talked him out of it. No, no, they said. He's back in his home dimension, getting reinforcements. Seeing those abilities in the green slot, I invented the idea, on the spot, that he would polymorph himself into one of the members of the Righteous Squad of Questing Adventurers. I picked Gink because I thought he was the character, apart from Sigurd's brother, that Lars would have the most affinity for. And I think I was right. When Lars realized what had happened, when he realized that Robbie had been complicit in it the entire time, he turned to me and, and I want to emphasize this, with no humor, and said, Uh, you're a real son of a bitch, Matt. <laughs> Which is pretty much the best thing a player can say to a DM. Gink had never been with the party. I went to Robbie after that game and said, Hey, let me tell you what's going on. There's this green slot who just polymorphed into your character. How would you like to play him? Robbie and I talked about what that meant. It wouldn't actually be Gink. It would be this alien spellcaster. And we talked about the various explanations he would have for why he couldn't do Gink stuff. And the party bought it all. He was sick. He was infected with a slot tadpole. And of course, because he was a green slot, he was pretty effective in combat when necessary. Robbie was never playing Gink. He had been playing the green slot the entire time. That's why the real Gink was tied up with the rest of the Righteous Squad of Questing Adventurers around the portal. 
Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, it means I've done a very bad job of explaining it because that kind of thing where I went to Robbie and said, hey, do you want to help me pull a fast one on the other players? I mean, that couldn't happen in a video game or a board game or a card game or a miniature war game. It could only happen in a role-playing game. It could only happen in D&D. Now, even though they felt as though I had tricked them, which I had, and that Robbie had fooled them, which he did, uh, they still won. They beat Colorado the Vile the week after that in what was one of the most epic battles I've ever run. And the players told me afterwards, that was epic. That was the most memorable thing that's ever happened in D&D. I could have run that game a dozen times with a dozen different players, and that specific situation would never have come up. We invented it on the spot, me and Robbie. And the players knew it. The fact that it was being invented dynamically on the spot is one of the things that made it feel more real. Millions of people play D&D every month. No other game of D&D has ever gone exactly the same as that one did. And no other game ever will. That's why we play D&D. That's why it's worth all the preparation. I don't intend to do a whole lot of let me tell you about my campaign videos, but hopefully you found that comprehensible and inspiring, and maybe you can show it to people and be like, this is why we do this. This is why this is our hobby. Peace. Out.